Hey everyone, I'm Julianne Meyer. You are watching Own Your Wellness. And before we officially get crack a lacking, um, I wanted to tell you something I was thinking about, and it has to do with, I think it was Halston, and it was a document, not a documentary, but kind of like a biopic of him that I watched. And he was about to go broke, and he was trying to get his designs out and all this, and he was spending oodles of money on, I think it, flowers, but I can't remember what kind, but he was spending probably thousands of dollars on flowers. So his money manager was like, why are you wasting your money on this? And he was like, it's part of the process. Um, so anyway, um, what made me think of that <laughs> was I'm sitting here before we get going and I'm using my Adora Therapy Chakra Boost. Uh, and this is for communication. And I always rub it on my um, palms and smell it before we get going. And I was thinking about how, you know, we have rituals and we have things that we do that whether or not they actually make sense really do help us creatively. So I thought that that was interesting that he said that at the time, I thought he was a little bananas <laughs> when I was watching this, <laughs> but I also have this like crazy um, prosperity boost. And I don't, I mean, I'm a science background, so I don't necessarily believe that. But I'm telling you, ever since I started using that, I made like triple what I would make in a month and two weeks. So there might be something to it. But anyway, I am so excited about today's guest. Her name is Kat Kennan. Let's bring her on to the stage. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. So glad to have you here. I'm about to sneeze probably. So if I do, please uh, forgive me. But, um, you know, you and I had the privilege to speak the other day and I've been excited to speak with you ever since. But not everybody knows who you are yet. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself and what brings you here today. Yeah, absolutely. So I am um, a marketing executive and entrepreneur um, for my entire career, basically. Um, and I'm also a trauma survivor and advocate, which is a huge part of my story. And all of those things have now come together and to my company, which is called Radical Customer Experience. I love that. And why Radical Customer Experience? I think that one customer experience is very misunderstood and it's usually bucketed under pure customer support. Um, when in reality, it is way more encompassing, mm -hmm. but also it's time for brands to sort of step up and do more and think beyond the box. And so when I thought about naming my company, just the word radical really made a lot of sense. And it um, has now gone on to bleed into a lot of other branding items of mine. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know, something that um, I appreciate about you is that while you've experienced traumas, and most of us, I mean, we all have to some extent, some are arguably worse than others. Uh, that being said, it doesn't necessarily define who you are, yet you honor what's happened and you bring that forward. So I'd love for you to speak a little bit more about, um, about not necessarily about your traumas, but about how you noticed that there was this need. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have complex PTSD. Um, obviously, we're all pretty familiar with PTSD. Um, when you throw in the complex, it just means many things have, have come together um, to make it that much more complex. And um, a number of years ago, I, um, I suffered two back-to-back -back pretty horrific traumas huge part of my story. But since I'm, you know, a marketing and data nerd, while I was like really not in an awesome place, I realized that I was perceiving marketing messages and advertising very differently than I normally would. And that's when I knew I was onto something, but I wasn't quite sure, you know, like where it was going to go. And now, um, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, it's all sort of come together. But, um, you know, I think in terms of our experiences, absolutely, every single one of us have experienced trauma. Um, you know, I don't like to use the terms like little T or big T. I think it's, 
you know, how traumatic something has been for each person as an individual. That's really important to understand. Um, but I wouldn't change anything that's happened to me because all, all of my experiences, both, you know, amazing and traumatic have all come together to make this person who's right here talking to you. And oh, I think I'm pretty awesome. So, <laughs> well, I would agree. And I'm glad that you think so, because that's more important than what anybody else thinks. <laughs> But I'm so glad you said little T versus big T because I felt really uncomfortable saying, you know, some traumas are worse than others because when it's yours, it's bad. <laughs> you know, it is. Um, so it's like there's this thing in, in the addiction world where people trauma compare. And, and the thing that I've noticed, too, is that, you know, some of these people – who have had things like they've been branded and um, kept in cages. I mean, I'm talking about somebody that I know branded and kept in a cage and um, human trafficked. She would arguably say that it wasn't as bad as so-and-so's and we're sitting there going, <laughs> excuse me. Um, that's, you know, you need to take care of you and, so, you know, it, it's one of those things that I, and that's a totally extreme example. I mean, not everybody deals with any, you know, stuff like that. But um, did you notice too, that people tend to trauma compare? Absolutely. And, you know, um, during the pandemic, I went back and got a certification in being a trauma-informed professional. And I was able to marry my own experiences with trauma with current research and you know, really understanding what's happening in the body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've probably all heard the term generational trauma, but, you know, right now research is indicating that we're all holding literally in our DNA in our bones um, up to 14 generations of trauma and thereby also influencing, you know, with our lives, the following 14 generations. So no matter you know, how little T someone wants to categorize you. Um, you know, the fact is that we're all holding vast amounts of trauma um, and it changes, you know, it changes our DNA, changes our brain chemistry. So, yeah. It really does. And, you know, I like this idea too, because when you and I spoke privately, I was talking about how sometimes there are certain pains that I feel that I know just aren't mine. <laughs> I just know they aren't, but I still feel them and it's still very real. I'm still experiencing it in my body. You know, my cells are reacting to something. So it is, it is real for me, whether or not it's mine. Um, you know, it's, I think I've mentioned this too. It's the whole idea of somebody TPing your yard. Is it fair that somebody did that? Probably not, but uh, it's still my job to clean it up. So <laughs> whether or not it's I did it, I still have the honor <laughs> to clean that up. Uh, and it does depend on how you look at things. But um, I'd love for you to give an example in the marketing world of being more sensitive to maybe somebody's trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, so one thing I teach my clients is how to implement trauma-informed marketing. And, you know, I think when you first, you know, particularly, you know, from a corporate perspective, hear the words trauma-informed um, alone, you know, let alone trauma-informed marketing, it's sort of like, you know, deer in headlights. Um, but the reality is it's just being empathic and sensitive to your customers. So, you know, we've already established that we have all experienced trauma at whatever level, at whatever period of time, you know, even like genetically. But, you know, there are key moments during the year where it may be a critical time for a brand to make sales, but with messaging, um, they can really make their customers feel seen and heard and make money at the same time. So a perfect example of this 
um, would be a campaign around, say, Mother's or Father's Day. Now, many of us have lost a parent. I know I have. And, you know, the first time I saw a campaign like this, it was, I think it was my first Mother's Day without my mom. And so now I think that the example I saw was from a brand called Uncommon Goods, but I've also seen Etsy and Ancestry do something similar where, you know, they send out messaging that's like, hey, we know this time of year is tough for many of you. Click here to opt out of our Mother's Day messaging. And, you know, for me, and I know for, for many of us, like you get so bombarded, you know, particularly during holidays, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's everywhere you turn, every commercial on the TV, like everything in your social feed, um, you know, even if it's from your friends, it's like, happy Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day. And, you know, it makes me sort of want to like bury my head under the pillow, mm -hmm. but um you know, receiving a message like that from a brand, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I feel seen. Mm -hmm. They understand. And, you know, from a cut and dry marketing perspective, they're just segmenting their database, right? It's mm -hmm. super smart, um, you know, and as a customer, like me seeing that, I'd always love that, that brand, always for years. But now, my loyalty to them comes from a completely different place. You know, <laughs> of really, really feeling like they get it. They're sensitive to not only my needs, but the needs of all of their customers. Mm -hmm. I love that, you know, and I think that from the consumer's point of view is we also, it's almost like we have to deal with it. You know, as in we don't even know that there's possibly another way like it doesn't have to be like that. It kind of makes me think. And this is just a different sort of example. You'll bear with me, uh, <laughs> you know, back in, say, the 60s when um, men sexually harassed women at work and it was totally acceptable. <laughs> it's just the way it was. That was just men being men and women just took it because that's just how it was. Uh, but I like this idea of growing into the sensitivity of what people are experiencing. And, you know, as a business owner myself, it's freaking brilliant. Like, why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> you know, because ultimately, um, if you are an entrepreneur or you know, even big business, you really want your customers to be happy. No matter what place you're coming from, you want your customers to be happy. Why wouldn't you take this little tiny pivot <laughs> and do this? Have you noticed, um, is there a way, since you're a data nerd, is there a way for businesses to um, sort of track how this is going? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even your traditional marketing analytics will show you, whether it's with your email marketing or your social marketing, you're going to see, you know, an influence on your opens and clicks, right? or the engagement you get on social and obviously tying into actual purchases. Um, I think, you know, it's easy to track from that perspective and, you know, brands may very well find that they're making more money than they traditionally would. Um, I also talk about, I think it's sort of like a sister um, strategy called strength-based marketing and, you know, we've all been taught as marketers fear-based marketing, right? We have to create urgency. You know, it's it's limited time, only till midnight. You know, there's just a few left. You know, you better buy it now. And, you know, the reality is, like, those kind of strategies are really psychologically damaging. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly now, we're in the middle of a ever-increasing mental health crisis. Now, I refuse to believe that there are groups of people sitting in a conference room thinking about, you know, how they can offend or hurt people. Um, <laughs> I mean, I certainly would hope that's not true. Um, but, you know, those campaigns and tactics are created leaning into their data, right? It's mm -hmm. like the reality of what stock is left, the reality of like creating a promotion. But you can use that same data and create a, a, 
a strength-based message. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, instead of saying something about limited quantity, you can say, you know, send out a message like, hey, we know these are your favorites. Um, you know, certainly there are a lot of, I mean, beauty brands come to mind, right? Mm-hmm. When you get an email that's like, these are our customer favorites this month, right? Yeah. It's the same data, <laughs> absolute same data um, and a completely different user experience. That's actually fascinating to me because I, I think <laughs> about, you know, well, one is anybody who tells me limited time at this point, I'm like, you know what, then I don't need it. <laughs> I have told, It just bothers me and it has for the longest time. It's one thing, like if say you're have a coaching program and there's 10 slots, if there are 10 slots, there are 10 slots and that's what there is. And the, But there's so many people who say there's only 10 slots left. And meanwhile, they haven't sold any of them yet. <laughs> and that just drives me bananas. <laughs> but I think too about... Um, when I get those emails and things like these are the customer, fa- I always look at those. I always look because I want to see, is there something new in here or am I, you know, missing something? Because if other people like this, then <laughs> I know, it's fascinating to me. And <laughs> now, um, when we come back from the commercial, I want to talk a little bit more about like um, how insidious, I hate that word. Let's try a different word. Um, how sneaky maybe, or we're not even realizing we're being marketed to (laughs) that kind of stuff. But I like this idea of using something negative that's happened to people and showing them honor and respect. And also, you know, business is business. I'm not saying people shouldn't be able to do that. And obviously you aren't either. Um, You've got to be one of the only people who are doing this. I'm pretty sure I'm creating a new marketing niche. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to pop up your website right now, too. Um, yeah, I think that that's really creative. And I love that you use data, but use it differently. Is that something that um, sets you apart from other people as well? Or do you think that, I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, certainly like as marketers, it's like, where's the data, you know, analytics, analytics, analytics. And, um, you know, but there one is there's a lot of data that it gives you a lot of information and yet gives you zero insights, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, knowing even knowing like the number of likes or something that you are getting or something what does it really tell you about your customers Um, or traditional demographics and psychographics? Mm -hmm. You know, I, for example, I'm a single mom. I, you know, I live in New York city. I love to bake, right? These are all things, you know, age, sex, you know, um, all these things about me that you could, you could pull out of data, but what does it really tell you about me as a person? Unless you're King Arthur flowers, that is, um, <laughs> you really don't know anything about me or what might appeal to me. So, you know, data really is King, but, or queen, um, but, um, has to be the right data. I like that. It's not just random numbers. Awesome. All right. (laughs) On that note, it is time for us to go to a commercial break. So uh, we'll be back in just a moment. And for those of us who are watching or those of you who are watching us live, thank you so much for being here. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more, as I mentioned, about how important this marketing idea that Kat is creating, because we're not even aware of when we're being marketed to. We'll be back in just a minute.
When drug or alcohol addiction take over, things begin to disappear. Your friends, your family, and eventually, you. Recommended by Dr. Phil, New Method Wellness can help get your life back with individualized treatment plans for dual diagnosis clients. New Method Wellness provides the most highly credentialed treatment in a safe and welcome environment. Call New Method Wellness for your free consultation and ask about our national accreditations. Together, we can put the pieces back together. everyone let's bring Kat back to the show welcome so during the or right before the commercial break I should say um, I was talking a little bit about you know this idea of marketing and your place and how you're helping people and I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about what it's like to work with you and uh, you know who you work with all the fun stuff yeah absolutely um, so I would say that um, my um, my ideal clients or customers are mostly consumer facing. So, you know, if you are selling or marketing your product directly to consumers, you absolutely want to talk to me. Um, but, uh, you know, not only do I do this consulting work in terms of teaching brands how to be more trauma informed, um, primarily in the marketplace, but also in the workplace. Um, I've created um, this brand new product, um, speaking of analytics, and I'm so excited about. I really think it's a game changer, um, but we're calling it the brand sensitivity score. So we were talking about brands being more sensitive a few minutes ago. And, you know, now we have something that will measure that. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> wow. And speaking to your point a little bit earlier, uh, you know, you'd hate to think that people are sitting in a room like, Whoa, oh, oh, like how can we offend people and hurt their feelings? And <laughs> <laughs> so um, how does that, how did you come up with that? I guess is a better way to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in my business, I, I work in three uh, key tenets, um, which is radical vulnerability, radical empathy, and radical authentic investment. And, you know, I, I knew all of these things would help business. I knew they would increase revenue um, on the workplace, decrease turnover, increase efficiency. Um, but I wasn't quite sure how to show it in the data. And I was able to put together um, this platform. Um, think about it, you know, we're all familiar with a net promoter score, right? Which is, honestly, it's one question. We've all gotten that pop up a million times. Would you recommend us to a friend on a scale of one to 10, right? And, you know, MPS is certainly a predictor. 100%. It's a predictor. Um, but really, all it tells a brand is, on average, this is how much your consumers are willing to recommend you, right? Um, 
so I don't know. In reality, I feel like that's not true data, you know? Um, and also like most or all survey polling tools need at least three questions to even be scientifically valid. Mm. So um, also something to keep in mind. Um, but, you know, we created a series of 18 questions um, from these three tenets and it essentially functions almost like an SAT, where if someone, you know, on the SAT side, someone answers a question wrong, the question gets easier, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the opposite. So here, when it is um, dialing into brain sensitivity, it sort of measures that in either direction, depending on the answer. And, you know, at the end, it does give you a score, gives you a score of where you rank um, compared to other brands. Um, in each of those three tenets, um, produces recommendations. Um, you know, this is what you need to do in order to increase like this area. And I, I mean, I feel like I could talk about it forever. I'm like geeking out on my own product, but <laughs> you know, there's just nothing like this out there. And I think, um, you know, for most, I think for all brands, really, like this is such a game changer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have any questions, like if I can see the sign up link in front of you on the screen, but, you know, please, please reach out. Like, I think um, this is critical. So, yeah, exactly. And I actually have a question for you. And, and this is more of a, your personal thoughts. Um, so, you know, I never talk about politics because it's so polarizing, um, but I guess my question is, is with what you do and this, what you offer companies and businesses now, what I may consider completely insensitive, somebody else would consider how dare you, you know, what I consider sensitive is wrong. So does this kind of work for who you're trying to, who you're catering to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what I do fits under a larger umbrella of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, mm -hmm. um, primarily externally facing, but um, it, it fits along also with companies who have been on the forefront of things like sustainability mm -hmm. um, or how they engage with their communities. Um, it, it's a huge part of it. Or, you know, are they, authentically investing in, you know, the people that live in their communities, right? Like every brand has, you know, a headquarters office, right? And so their community, not only is their customers across the country or perhaps the world, but also the people that are, you know, really in their homes, right? Um, it's really important to do things beyond, you know, a park bench, or a street cleanup. It's really to authentically invest. And, you know, this, this product, one, gets at it. Um, but two, like, the brands that are on the forefront of all of this are winning at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And, um, and now we have a way to measure it as well. I love that. I love how you said authentically, because I'm sure a lot of people really or at least I would like, I love to see the best in people. So I'm going to assume the best in people, but they think that they are. <laughs> they're telling themselves that they are, but they're missing a piece. They're blind to something. <laughs> um, speaking about being blind to something, you know, I, I talked a little bit about this idea of when we're not even aware that we're being marketed to. And the reason why I bring this up and I'm not... There to me, in my mind, there is we are all selling something, whether it's trying to get our kids to eat vegetables or whatever the case may be, we are all selling something. So I want to not demonize this idea of marketing because um I don't think there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> I mean, as far as you know, trying to get your message or your product out there. I love what you're doing because it makes it more sensitive to the people that are trying to consume your products. Um, but I do this coaching class or this uh, 
it's not a class, but it's a 30 day challenge. And one of the things that it's about is, you know, it's about trying to change something or anything. And part of what I teach about is how the difference between accomplices and friends and how there are so many accomplices we're not even aware of that are helping us stay in the things that we're doing. And how does marketing play into, um, you know, like maybe some things that I don't think anybody should be blind to what's happening to them. What are some things that maybe people aren't aware of that is marketing? Does that make sense? (laughs) I mean, honestly, like everything that you're surrounded by literally is marketing and advertising. So, you know, even like if you're scrolling through Instagram and, you know, a brand, um, you know, that you follow or perhaps a friend follows. So it comes up in your feed is literally sharing a gif, right? Like that's something that's just funny. They're still marketing to you because you're like, oh, there's like human voice here. Oh, right. Um, And I think um, like I don't think that any of us should be blind to that. Um, But, um, you know, there are just ways to do it, um, which are inherently more sensitive and more dialed in um, to um, you know, the fact that we are marketing and selling to human beings, mm-hmm. um, you know, even on the B2B side, you know, when you pick up the phone or send the email, you're sending it to another human being. You're yeah. not sending it to a company. And so, you know, creating those relationships, right, whether it's like one to one or one to many, like in terms of social or email, it's so, so important. You know, I... <sighs> What I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, is there's a a conscientious way of doing things. (laughs) And if you can do it that way, why would you choose, for example, the fear-based marketing when it's just as effective for the customer to have like you said, um, these are our customer favorites versus limited, <laughs> about to be gone. <laughs> these go quick. Bye now. <laughs> oh my goodness. I yeah. I've always been. Um, I was just thinking about when I was at this luncheon, and it was one of these things where the investment was five thousand dollars, and it was only if you bought it right after that luncheon, and it was the invitation only. And my thought was, if I can't think about it for 48 hours, 24, 48 hours and come back. And it's not for me because if I can be talked into something that quickly, then I can be talked out of it just as quickly. (laughs) (laughs) And then I'm going to be $5,000, you know, less in my bank account. (laughs) Um, Do you find, what is, what are your thoughts about like using persuasion Yeah. I mean, it's tough. And like, I fall, I don't know if I should use the word victim or not. Maybe it's the only use case where I would use that word. Um, But, uh, you know, all the time, you know, people ask for a few minutes on your calendar and it's just pure pitch, right? Mm -hmm. You know what? I know when I have the first conversation with someone, I just try to listen, right? Before I before I'd ever even like dream of selling them a product, like who are they, you know, Um, what are their needs? And, you know, maybe what I do is a fit. Maybe it's not, but that's okay. You know, maybe they know someone that I could help, Um, you know, or maybe I just met someone who's super awesome. You know, that's great too. Um, But I think that it's not so much, um, that people or, or companies or brands are purposely doing this fear-based marketing. I think it's just all we've been taught. And, you know, if, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, right, you could go on LinkedIn right now and view like contributing articles from marketing experts or, you know, and it's going to tell you the same marketing strategies that we've been talking about for the last 50 years. Um, you know, I mean, if you are still talking about things like the buyer's journey, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, it, you know, it was great being you 15 years ago, but you're a little out of date. 
So, um, um, but you know, there are just new ways. Like if we are quick to embrace like new technologies and new tools, why aren't we just as quick to embrace a new way of thinking about things? Yes. You know, <laughs> what I am thinking of is I'm going to say something and then I'm going to explain. You just ran the first four minute mile. And, <laughs> you know, what I mean by that is that was impossible until it was possible. Nobody really, you know, thought about it or tried or all that. There's been so many things in the world where we just get stuck because it's comfortable and we know it. And, you know, it's not the only way. I actually went and saw Timber Hawkeye. I don't know if I, I don't expect you to know who he is, but he wrote, um, I can't remember something boot camp. Anyway, he was a monk for years and uh, interesting, interesting guy. He's really cool. <laughs> And um, he pulls out this tongue depressor and on the front it says, tell me more. And that to your thing, you know, about <laughs> talking to somebody, tell me more. And then on the inside, it says, it, there's nothing, this isn't about you. And I just thought that it was just kind of interesting how, and the reason why I bring that up is because there's such a, it's, the society now, it's like, it's my way. And I'm right, and it has to be done like this versus realizing that as long as you get your result, it doesn't have to look like that along the way. <laughs> Why not try something different? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, these kinds of strategies and tactics, you know, test it out, right? Like it costs, you know, whether it's in terms of like, you know, uh, physical cost or time cost. You know, it's it's such a little investment, right? Like that first time I saw a Mother's Day campaign, it was a text message, right? The the their marketing manager or you know whoever put that message out, it took them you know an hour of their time, right? Like it just didn't take a lot, and yet it made a world of difference to me, and I'm sure so many other people who got that as well. So. You know, just just try it. I don't yeah. think that um, companies are using fear based techniques because, um, you know, it's they're ill intentioned. I think, you know, again, we've been doing these for a long time and the reality is that they work mm -hmm. big like asterisks. They work in the short term. And, you know, if you as a company are looking for long term sustainable growth, it's time to look at new strategies. Mm -hmm. I love that. On that note, we are going to go to another commercial break. We'll be back in just a second. And I said hello to everybody who's watching us live. Now it's my turn to say hello to everybody who's watching us on demand. When we return, we're going to continue this conversation. I want to pick her brain, Kat's brain, about just, you know, maybe even in general, looking and trying different things. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots, and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices.
real experiences. Raw conversation. One destination for it all. E360 TV. Welcome back, everyone. Let's bring Kat back. Welcome back. So um, during the commercial break, I was thinking about how to phrase this question because uh, I think it's really important for anybody out there. And this has to do with you and your process. So we were talking about trying something new and you've literally created this new market, you know, this new idea for marketing. For anybody who's out there, how, you know, how did you even create this? Does that make sense? Like, how did this come about? I mean, because there's so many people out there that have ideas and then they let them die on the table without doing anything about it. But you took something and made it happen, turned it into reality from thought form into reality. How did you do that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it certainly wasn't overnight. You know, at the beginning of our conversation, I talked about sort of being deep in a trauma reaction and having this realization about how is perceiving messages. That was in 2019. So um, I knew I was onto something. I knew I was onto something enough to form my LLC, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, certainly started talking about it, talking to friends and colleagues about it, but I wasn't quite there yet. Um, you know, particularly at the time, there were a lot of companies talking about a 360 degree customer experience. So companies like, you know, Salesforce or Forrester. And, you know, while I, while this idea came to me, I thought, man, maybe 280 on a good day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 um, you know, but while I was thinking about it, I also say that, you know, as the pandemic started, I accidentally got a full time job. Um, and, you know, so I ran marketing for uh, an NGO for almost three years. But I was always thinking about, you know, the business and this idea and really what radical customer experience really was, what trauma informed marketing looked like. Um, you know, and I also talked about how during the pandemic, I got this certification. Um, and so, you know, when my uh, full time job ended last fall, I just thought it's now or never. Right. And I owe it to myself. And, you know, particularly after everything I, that I've been through or I've been through in the the, um, the five years prior, I just thought, you know, now's the time. And I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like. Um, but I also found like once I made that decision, pieces just started falling into place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe, maybe I was using, um, you know, prosperity on my, you know, um, on my pressure points or, or something. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, even in October, I was thinking about this, like, solely from a consulting perspective. And, you know, but since that time, like I had a book project happen unexpectedly, and then this software all happened unexpectedly just within a few months. So I guess for anyone watching and listening, I would just say like, um, sometimes just like sort of drawing a line in the sand and saying like, now I'm going to give it a go. Mm -hmm. um, and it's okay if we fail, right? We all fail all the time. It's like, you know, how we learn. But just making that conscious decision to give it a go. It's like, I have nothing to lose. All right. Maybe I have some money to lose, but um, why not? <laughs> I like that. You know, there's something because it takes courage to do what you did. And especially because you're going to run up against people who are going to tell you that you're crazy. You don't know what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. The naysayers. And the funny thing about, and I'm saying this not to you, but to the audience the funny thing about the naysayers is they call you crazy. They call you whatever, all these names until you do it. And then they ask you how you did it. So as long as you keep going. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That makes me think about, um, 
gosh, I was saying this to someone yesterday, like when this whole sort of uh, journey towards vulnerability and empathy started was probably when I first heard of Brene Brown. Right. And, um, and I didn't even realize that maybe like that was the spark Mm. as it was years before, you know, even the traumas that I talked about happened. And, um, but I always think about, you know, that quote she pulls from Teddy Roosevelt about being in the arena and, you know, (laughs) I feel it every time too, right? Um, But it's really easy to sort of be in the stands, right? And to like throw things that people are in the arena and yell. Um, But I would so much rather, oh, I'm going to get emotional, but I would so much rather like be like, down in the arena fighting, you know, for everything Mm -hmm. than just yelling, you know, from up in the stands, like, yeah, yeah, you know, not being a part of, of. yeah, (laughs) absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that. (laughs) Um, So something else that I was thinking about is it has to do with like, uh, you know, this idea of You know, what do you tell yourself when people are throwing things and yelling? And how do you sort of not listen to the barking dogs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as you're trying to complete what you're trying to do? How do you do that? Because I know that it's one thing to say not to or to, you know, look at it, but it's quite another thing when people are literally hurling things at you. And not to take that personally or to not pay attention. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, like I realized long ago that my I was probably my own worst enemy. I was probably the loudest one throwing things on myself. Um, But, you know, I think I've just been through too much in life to not believe in myself. Mm -hmm. And. Um, not only having experienced it, but having survived it. So, you know, someone like not believing in my business or, you know, my point of view, you know, sorry, it's not going to stop me. Um, And, you know, the other thing I always keep in mind, and I think this is so, so important, particularly for entrepreneurs, is to remember to be gentle with yourself. Um, someone asked me the other day, uh, what that really meant, right? Like how, what that really looked like for entrepreneurs. And, you know, sometimes like you're so into a task and you're frustrated or it feels like it's never happening. Sometimes it's taking a moment and even like stare at the wall, Mm -hmm. you know, um, take a walk around the block, uh, take a nap, right? Like all of these little recoveries that you can put in throughout your day and throughout your week, like just makes such a difference into um, not feeling defeated when, you know, those things are being thrown and hurled at you. Wow. Yeah. I really like (laughs) that because it is, self-care is not (laughs) self-indulgent. There is a huge difference between, and even if you are being self-indulgent sometimes, why not? I mean, seriously, why not? Why not treat yourself? <laughs> Life is hard. Life is so hard, right? Yeah. And and even more so, like, I, you know, like think about the last two years and everything that we've all been through just as a society with COVID. I mean, goodness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think we owe it to ourselves to just take a moment to breathe. Exactly. Exactly. You know, something that I was thinking about, too, um, was this idea, you know, you, you had said sometimes you'll lose money <laughs> when you're working <laughs> on these ideas. But there's a I, I don't I don't think it's a quote per se, but um, this idea that I heard and it made it so much easier for me to make take chances. And it was to just sit there in the knowledge that my life is good, whether this works out or not. <laughs> 
this has very little bearing on whether I'm going to choose my own happiness and joy. Yes, I want this to work out. Yes, I'm going to do whatever I can to make it work out. But if it doesn't, it doesn't mean that my life is over. And I think that that kind of helps with the sort of caveman thinking <laughs> where, you know, we attach a lot of meaning to the things that we're doing and get attached to that versus, you know, I'm going to create this and let the world have it. <laughs> so I like this idea of... Um, of just, you know, stepping into your ideas and creating them. So I guess what I want to ask too, and this is more of a marketing question, <laughs> is what do you find to be the most antiquated idea out there? I mean, is there one that you, that just screams to you or are there many? <laughs> Oh my goodness. There are probably too many to count, but certainly, <laughs> um, certainly a pet peeve of mine is people talking about the buyer's journey. Like it's the latest and greatest, um, you know, or, you know, what are, what are your personas? Oh my God. And my head could just explode. And, um, you know, I know I was just as guilty of using those words and those techniques in the past, but um, yeah, like we're just so much further beyond that. Like if you think, for example, of the buyer's journey, you've, you know, the traditional graphic of these four steps, right, that the customer uh -huh. is going through. Well, the reality is that it's more like that, you know, there is a journey, but it's certainly not straightforward. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a brand or a marketer, you want to figure out, you know, how often you can interact with your customers. Um, you know, the other thing that really upsets me um, as both a customer and a marketer, because I think we owe it to our customers to do better, are all of those like posts or advertisements that um, play up on trauma, I think, mm. right now. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly there is a movement towards self-care. There's a movement towards self-awareness and like, you know, um, working on mental health. And, you know, the thing that I see literally every day um, on Instagram in particular is all of these apps and things that are like geared towards mindfulness. And I've literally seen messages that are that are like, what's your trauma? like click here for the test. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I realize these two pet peeves sort of fit in very different buckets, but um, there's, to me, there's just nothing even remotely as offensive as that, um, <laughs> that I think is intended to create urgency or intrigue. And instead it's very victim blaming and <laughs> um, but I, obviously very upsetting. Um, you know, I think for me and any, any survivor for sure. No, I love that. I love that you shared that because those people who are also offended by that don't have to feel alone. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Kat, that is all the time that we have for today. I just wanted to say thank you so much for being on the show. You've been very helpful and knowledgeable and thanks for standing up and creating this new way of interacting with the customer and client base. It's pretty amazing. Oh, thank you so much. And definitely, you know, visit, visit us on the website, um, check out um, our cancel culture checkup. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing from all of you, anything I can do to help. Um, I am here not only to help, but more importantly, to listen. I love that. Thank you so much. And everyone, that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us. And I just want you guys to enjoy the rest of your week. Bye for now.